Hello, this is Gerald Roberts from the Grob Chess Club, and I am proud to present our first video chess lecture for the site. We are going to start doing uh, chess lectures from now on instead of the annotated games, just because I feel that this kind of a presentation of the game will be more effective as a learning tool, and also it's uh, a little bit more fun to, to go through. Sometimes when you write down the moves, it's it's a little uh, boring to say the least. So. This is a game we're going to go over uh, of mine from the Elkhart County Chess Club. Uh, the, the championships just got over uh, at the beginning of April. And I played in the reserve section, and this was the round six games. It was a seven round tournament, uh, one game a week, but I had already played my round seven opponent. So um, going into this game, I had a perfect score. Whereas my opponent, Tom Smith, he was a half point back. So if I lost the game, uh, it was likely that he was going to win the tournament. So I really wanted a draw, or actually I wanted to win the game, because winning the game would mean that my rating would soar from 1344 to 1500. So we're going to see how the game goes, and hopefully you enjoy this new format. Okay, I played e4, and my opponent played c6. Um, the Karl Khan. This is known to be a very uh, drawish opening. Uh, it's very solid, but um, draws to say the least. So he's not really going to be pressing for too much for a while. Um, so we'll see. I just played d4, d5, standard moves. Um, and then now my I have several choices. I can push e5. Uh, there's knight c3. Um, but usually when I play against the French or the these solid kind of structures, I like to play knight d2, which is a more positional move. Uh, the point is that if uh, d4 ever comes under attack by, say, c5 at some point, um, I'm going to have more control of, of the d4 square by being able to move my my b1 knight into a position at f3, or say b3, where it's going to be able to have more control of that square. So I play knight d2, and then here he plays e6, switching to a uh, French. And before the game, I actually thought he was going to play a French. So it surprised me when we played the Karl Khan, but there's a problem with doing this sort of semi-slav structure, um, and that is that he spent this whole tempo playing c6, but usually when you play a French, you want to play c5 in one move, just to break away uh, at my pawn center, just hitting the e4 point, um, going at it with knight uh, c6 and queen b6. Let me show you that. Usually, when you play an advanced French, which is what sort of why I ended up playing, um, Black be a tempo up because he plays c5 and will move. And then it's more like White's trying to catch up with him. But now that he's wasted the whole tempo on c6, I can actually push e5 without a problem. Um, since I've wasted two tempos on moving my e pawn. He'll have to waste two tempos on a C pawn, and White's actually going to be better here than he would in a typical French advance. So then he goes for Knight Eastman, which I don't really agree with. Um, I believe his plan is to get his Knight into a manageable spot. Obviously, he can't go to F6 straight away because the pawn. But I don't think that the Knight E7 route is the best. Instead, I prefer maybe going Knight H6. Uh, with the idea of jumping to to f5, and then maybe one had to play bishop d3, and then maybe he'll be able to get a lot of pressure going, and I might actually have to exchange my my good bishop for it. Or another idea, instead of playing the knight e7, he can play f6 just to chip away at my pawn uh, straight away. Maybe I'll play f4 here. I'm still better, but I think this has been a better plan for him. I really do. Uh, the problem with knight e7, there's not a direct problem with it, it's just that there are better moves out there, and by putting his knight on e7, he's stopping himself from playing c5, uh, which is typically what he wants to do. Even though he's already wasted a tempo playing c6, he really does want to play c5 at some point. So he's actually stopping himself from playing that in, in the next couple of moves. So now, I play knight d to f3, uh, the point being I could do knight g to f3, but I prefer knight d to f3 just because I'd like to bring my knight on g1 to e2 and then to g3 so I'll have more pieces on the king side. Um, he's already pushed c6, so I'm not. I, I, he usually castles king side, uh, and by pushing c6, I don't think he has any intention of castling queen side. Uh, 
So I'm getting my pieces ready for an attack on the king side if uh, such an occasion should arise. And also, moving my knight to f3 controls the d4 point, which is just an added plus. Oh, and another little plus of moving this way, uh, I free my bishop in one move. So he plays g6, um, d2, I continue with my plan, and he plays bishop g7, a move that I, I really don't like. Uh, by moving his bishop to g7, it's really just biting on granite at my e5 pawn. Uh, it's pretty solid, uh, the pawn chain that I've got going. He can't, he doesn't have much with it. Um, his knight was, or his bishop was much better, I think, on f8, where if he moves his knight to f5, say, uh, then he can push c5, and then he can bring his bishop out that way. But by bringing it to g7, he's just more or less admitting that that piece is just going to be bad for a while, and it doesn't have to be. Um, He's going to be a tempo down if he plays c5 because he's already played c6. We've gone over that, but uh, he has to do it if he if he wants to try for anything. So I just continue logically. I play knight g3, uh, and then he goes d7, just standard moves. Uh, bishop b3, and it turns out that that was a mistake um, because now if he wants, he can play queen to b6, uh, hitting my d4 pawn and most importantly the b2 pawn so I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to waste a tempo playing you know b3 or rook b1 or queen c1 I'm going to have to waste a tempo guarding that pawn now so then it doesn't really matter that he's wasted a tempo on c6 he can push c5 straight away but luckily he doesn't see it but he's knight b6 instead right square wrong piece and then now I play queen d2 um, an idea inspired just by seeing several uh, Sicilian games uh, against the Dragon. Um, I played the Yugoslav attack, which is a very good, um, has a very good record for white. Um, for those of you not familiar with the Yugoslav, e4, c5, go like this. Went one too far. There we go. And usually white here will like to play a bishop h6 just to get rid of this dark squared bishop. And then the the dark squares around black's king are going to be really weak. Uh, actually, Bally Fisher once said that in the Yugoslav attack against the dragon, it's as simple as opening up the h file and then sack sack mate. Uh, and it really it really is that easy. You push d4, h4, and you just start a pawn storm and things usually go very well for white. So the similar here is very, uh, the structure here is very similar to that because he's got this uh, this fiend shadow bishop on the king side and it just seems very a very weak structure to me so I believe that I can follow with the same plan and hopefully things will go well and then now he castles uh, so here I just continue with what I said before with bishop h6 I want to create those uh, weak dark squares around his king and then now here if he takes on h6 with the bishop I think uh, queen takes h6 and then if he doesn't do anything then bring in like knight g5 and have it mate in one um, so you, you can see how quickly things can fall apart for black and then here he makes a mistake uh, and he plays knight c4 not that his position was very good before anyway but here, I think he just wanted to attack my queen and my, my b2 pawn at the same time, which would be all fine and dandy, except that bishop controls that square, so I take. Now he takes back and he's got doubled c pawns, which is an added plus for me. And then now I take, he takes, and I put h4. I want to pry open the h file. Uh, I could castle king side or castle queen side and, and slow play it, and my position is better. But he might be able to, you know, play b5 and, you know, get a solid structure, and then my advantage is gone. So I figure that by not castling, my rook on h1 can actually be a powerful attacking piece. Now I don't have to wait for it. Uh, and this is where we're going to break for part two. Uh, this is part one. Um, hope to see you on the next lecture.